Hi there, loyal fans and listeners and people. Thank you for listening to the second episode of The Treasure of Boneyard Bay. We know you've had to wait for a long time, and we are just as excited as you are that it's finally here. This intro will be a bit of an introduction to the rest of the story, so it will be the longest of the intros, and later intros will be much shorter, I promise. So this version of The Treasure of Boneyard Bay is the standard edition, which is free for everyone to enjoy. It will be about 15 hours long, and it will be posted in 12 weekly episodes. This week's episode is about 40 minutes, but most will be around an hour. The last two episodes will be about two hours long. The version for sale on Bandcamp, and the version you get when you join our Patreon page in the Witch Hunter Master tier or higher, is the extended edition. This extended edition is 20 minutes longer and more interesting for fans invested in the lore and the background of the characters. This extra content is not absolutely necessary to understand or enjoy the story, but it does contain some interesting bits and pieces about the character backgrounds, especially Ludlov's and Chappelle's. It includes an extra Ludlov Gustav action sequence and might add a bit of a darker tone to the story overall. And um, it also finishes with an extra epilogue that will be of particular interest to fans of the original Witch Hunter. We never want to put these stories behind a paywall, so having these two editions is our way to keep our stories completely free, all the while working towards a model that will support us financially to pay for all the hardware and software that we've invested in to create these stories. That way we'd like to add more professionalism and quality to each new project. Eventually, of course, we'd love to turn this hobby of ours into our main source of income. We have tons of story ideas waiting to come to life, so we'd love to develop as many of them as possible into complete audio projects. We launched a Patreon page last year that helps us towards that goal. For example, thanks to our patrons, we were able to purchase a plugin to improve our sound and speed up the editing process at the same time. We could also pay for an extra musical composer, Ivan Dutch, by reinvesting some of our own Patreon earnings into his Patreon page. That has been a tremendous help, and we can't thank our patrons enough. They have been the fuel of this entire project with their support, encouragement, and input. And of course, they get rewarded in many ways, like with extra exclusive content, exclusive updates, and lots of exclusive merchandise. You can join our Patreon community from $1 a month on. That's only like buying us one huge chai tea latte a year, but it would mean the world to us, especially if lots of people support us like that. And even if you can't spare any money, we are really grateful for the likes, the comments, for subscribing, for leaving a review on Amazon, for you know, for the book version and Goodreads, um, and just your wonderful encouragement, your shares on YouTube, Podbean, and other uh, podcasting formats, social media, and of course, we thank you so much, above all, just for listening and joining us on this epic journey. So now we won't let you wait any longer. Please enjoy the next chapter of the treasure of Boneyard Bay. The River <coughs> They were up at dawn, except for Gustav, who was still snoring. Fortunately, he had never even opened his backpack before falling asleep, so he would be able to simply stand up and leave once he did wake up. Chapelle and Blessed Zeilenheim emerged out of the barn. When she saw the men standing around Gustav, Chapelle asked, What happened to him? Did he have too much to drink? He did not have anything. He just fell asleep as soon as someone other than himself was talking, Alvarado said. You should wake him before Master von Baumeister arrives. We've tried, Alvarado said. Did you try everything? We nudged him, shook him, shouted at him, Ludlov said. Chappelle nodded, turned and left. Perhaps the light of the rising sun will wake him up, Federhell suggested. 
Then Chappelle returned with a bucket of water. Everyone began to chuckle, except for the priestess, who looked a bit worried. Un, deux, trois. Chappelle counted. As soon as she emptied the contents of the bucket over Gustave's head, the Flatlander jumped up screaming. The initiates roared with laughter. Gustave immediately turned around. My backpack! My backpack! There are books in there! Notes! I've seen it withstand the rain, Ludlow said. It can take a bit of water. Gustave hugged his backpack tight, then shot an accusing glare at Chappelle. This is not funny, witch hunter! She shrugged. It was not meant to amuse you, but to wake you up. Well, well, it did that, he admitted, relaxing a bit. Then he smiled and noticed her piercing blue eyes. I suppose it was a bit funny. Just then, the front door of the farmhouse opened and Master von Baumeister came out, followed closely by Turmgard. It sounds like you're all having a merry morning, he said. I hope you can keep up your spirits. We have a long journey ahead. After a meagre breakfast, they bought some further provisions from the farmers and thanked them for their hospitality. The priestess performed the blessing ritual over the family's house as Uta and Felix brought them their horses, all looking well-groomed and fed. After a final greeting, the company left the farmstead and the village of Engebrücke. They followed the road north and traveled for a while through a quiet, shadowy wood of pine trees. As the day passed, the snow-capped peaks in the distance slowly grew closer, and by the evening they made camp in the hills in the shadow of the mountains. The next morning, they set out early for the final stretch to the river Landsader. Once they had completely left the mountains behind them, they knew they had come out of Evenendale and entered Liongrest. Even though spring was giving way to summer, it was a chilly and cloudy afternoon when at last they reached the wide, dark green river, slowly making its way through a green veil between wooded hills. We follow the river until we reach the place where our transport is moored, von Baumeister called out. They rode on in single file along the river, with Ludlov and Gustav once more dangling at the tail end. An hour later, they arrived at a quay where a single sailing vessel lay anchored. It looked like a fishing boat, and a rather old and rickety one at that. A frightfully thin man with greasy grey hair emerged out of a wooden shack beside the quay. I think you will have to serve as our interpreter, Gustave. They speak flatlandish in Lyoncrest, no? Alvarado called out. Gustave shook his head. Silly Esclavian, no. In the north they speak Leontish, which is similar to my tongue, but not the same. Here in the south they speak Goldorian, so Mademoiselle Chapelle will have to do the talking. Von Baumeister gestured with his head to Chapelle, urging her to move ahead in the line. She obeyed and greeted the man in Goldorian. He cackled, then succumbed to a fit of coughing that sounded quite worrying. Then he returned her greeting and they began to converse. It seemed to Ludlow the two were haggling. Chappelle seemed to grow increasingly frustrated with the conversation. Eventually, she turned her horse back to her traveling companions and addressed Master von Baumeister. He says we took longer to arrive than expected and he wants more coins. He shall have them, von Baumeister said coolly, reaching for his money purse and taking out a few more copper foxes. He gave the coins to Chappelle, who returned to the Lion Crester and handed over the money. He shrugged and accepted the money, even though he clearly wasn't impressed. Then he talked some more to Chappelle, who turned around on her saddle and called out to the master. We need to show a, a writ from the mayor to prove that we are the witch hunters. As if it isn't obvious enough we are, Tormgard sighed. Von Baumeister produced a sealed scroll and rode up to the greasy-looking man, handing it over. The lion crester broke the seal and read the parchment carefully. Finally, he nodded in satisfaction. Bado, 
Venez, he said. Et les chevaux? asked Chappelle. Calmez-vous, mademoiselle, the lion crester said. He gestured for them to dismount as another man emerged out of the shack. He was a lot younger and had an easy, friendly manner about him. Chappelle and the older man exchanged a few more words. His son will take care of the horses, she explained to the others. Very well, von Baumeister replied. Everyone dismounted and said their farewells to the animals who had carried them all the way from Seven Peaks. Then they followed the older man to the boat. We'll be sailing in it? Federhel asked. We will, von Baumeister answered. You are from a fishing village, are you not, Federhel? I am, but... Excellent. I'm sure you'll be able to pull your weight then. Furthermore, we have a flatlander and an esclavian in our midst. Surely they know something about boats. Gustav laughed. Ha! Know something about boats? I could sail this thing on my own! He exclaimed. Even better, said the witch hunter master. It turned out that Gustav indeed knew his way around the vessel. He took on the role of captain and steered them on their way. The wind was with them and the boat glided over the murky waters of the river easily. The paddles of six long oars stuck out from holes in the hull, but luckily rowing didn't prove necessary yet. Standing on the deck of the boat, Ludlov watched as the younger man led the horses away. Eventually, the quay and the shack faded from view as the river took a turn. Ludlow turned round and looked ahead. All he could see was the Lanzada carving its way through the pine-covered hills. <sighs> he sighed and only then realized just how hungry he was. It was evening when Ludlow emerged from below deck where he had taken a light supper. Gustav was still steering the ship. I've brought something for you to eat, Ludlow said. Thanks, Ludlow. But uh, I can't right now. I have to be careful here. The water is rather shallow and there are some sharp rocks below. It sounded strange to hear Gustav speaking responsibly about something. It was even slightly unsettling. Can I ask you something? Ludlov began. I'm at your disposal, witch hunter. Gustav replied, still looking focused on the waters ahead. Initiate only, for now. I've been wondering why you've been carrying such a big backpack. Gustav shrugged. Like I said, Ludlov, everything in there will be useful on our journey. You've got a collection of notes and information, I assume. You must know more about the treasure and about Boneyard Bay than any of us. Gustav grinned. Oh, is that it? You're curious about our journey? Well, yes. Ludlow admitted. We've been told precious little so far and I'd like to have some idea of what's ahead. Gustav's grin turned into a friendly smile. Ahead is Brughaven, capital of Lioncrest. From there we will set sail along the western sea, probably anchor down in Wainfu for a bit, and then continue on to Boneyard Bay. Yes, but what then? Ludlow asked. Surely we can't just disembark and ask the local population if they've seen any treasure lying around. <laughs> no, we can't. Wouldn't that be funny, though? Then what will we do? Gustav looked at him with a mysterious twinkle in his eye. Don't worry, initiate. My backpack will help. And that's all you need to know so far. The Theresia the boat was sailing on calm waters through a wide, flat landscape. Here and there, tall reeds and willow trees grew along the banks of the river. In the distance, they could see poplar trees and the occasional farmstead or windmill. Massive white clouds hovered in the sky like floating mountains, but they didn't obscure the sun, which shone down on them with a pleasant warmth. It looks a lot like my home country, Gustav said wistfully from behind the steering wheel. He had a small pipe in his mouth. Ludlow stood close by, leaning on the railing and watching the landscape slowly slide by. He turned around and faced Gustav. 
I must say, the north of Lioncrest is very different from the south. Alvarado and Federhel emerged from below deck. We must be getting closer to the sea, Federhel said. How do you know? Alvarado asked, but his friend simply shrugged. I just have a sense for these things. Comes from a background, I suppose. You are right, Federhel, Gustav said, wisps of smoke pouring forth from his mouth as he spoke. We are nearing Brughaven, the city of beer. Ah, great, Alvarado exclaimed, smashing his hands together excitedly. Then the quest can really begin. Gustav took out his pipe and smiled warmly at the Esclavian. So, you are looking forward to it then? Alvarado nodded emphatically. I have heard so many tales from my parents and grandparents about the legendary gold of Boneyard Bay. Many of them contradicted each other, so I still have no idea which ones were true, but now we can find out. He took a deep breath, enjoying the fresh air. I knew when it started that this was going to be a remarkable year. Gustav nodded and took another tug at his pipe. As the hours went by, they began to see more horses and wagons on the road, and eventually even a lone gull came flying by. Then the river turned due north, and the city of Brughaven appeared before them. Even from this distance, it appeared to be massive, far larger than Ludlow had expected, almost rivaling Seven Peaks, although it was very different in appearance. Whereas his home city was densely packed with tall, narrow buildings, Brughaven was wide and spread out, and its many houses, inns, shops and guild halls were only two stories high at most, although some were quite large. Here and there, a tower stood out, but there was really only one construction that rose above all the others, a church with a tall spire, similar to the Grand Cathedral of Seven Peaks, but much smaller. Still, it looked most impressive amongst these buildings. The next thing Ludlov noticed was the way the city had been built on top of the river. There was a complex network of bridges and walkways connecting various aisles, some natural, others man-made. As they came closer, he saw streets of water, where people travelled in small boats punted by men in feathered caps. Federhel climbed up the mast to take down the sail, and they all helped out with rowing the boat, as Gustav simply steered it into the city. There were no guards asking them who they were or where they came from, and the only walls Ludlov could see were around the central area, where the Grand Church was located. This city has seen precious little war, Tomgard commented, echoing Ludlov's own observations. Lucky beard gobblers. Oh, it's been invaded enough times, Federhel said. The Lancresters simply never chose to fight back. They'd rather not see their city ruined over politics. A sensible attitude, Ludlov thought, as long as the invaders weren't dragon-worshipping monsters or heathen barbarians. But Lioncrest was fortunate enough to be far removed from Felskar or the Horn Mountains. They finally moored their boat in an area where many other similar vessels lay. When they disembarked, they were approached by a colorfully dressed man in a feathered cap, who came asking for a docking fee. Master von Baumeister dutifully paid it, and then the companions were ready to explore the city. Feel free to take a look around, each of you, the master said. The order has already arranged our sleeping quarters. Unfortunately, the inns are too crowded for all of us to stay in the same place. Blessed Zeelenheim, Chapelle and Gustav will lodge at an establishment called the Zerob with me. Tomgard and the three initiates will stay at Het Verloren Anker. It's in the Sea Harbor district so you may already catch a glimpse of our transport for the remainder of this journey. If I may, what is this vessel called? 
Gustav asked. The Theresia, von Baumeister said, and her captain's name is Brökelhoff. You will meet him tomorrow. They split up, but not according to their sleeping arrangements, since Master von Baumeister had given them leave to explore the city first for a few hours. Ludlow decided to come with Gustav, Federhel and Chapelle in the direction of the harbour to take a look at the Theresia. The priestess went to visit the Grand Church, which was apparently called the Basilica of Santa Agnes. Alvarado was headed for the market to look for rare herbs and spices, and Turmgard followed von Baumeister around like a loyal lapdog, although Ludlow hadn't caught where they had set off to. Walking around with three companions felt freeing after being stuck in a boat with double that amount, and Ludlow found he enjoyed his current company, especially Chappelle. Federhel's endless tidbits of knowledge could become a bit exhausting after a while, and Gustav was still an unpredictable mystery, but still there was something naturally likable about both of them. Blue-eyed, golden-haired Chappelle was a lively, optimistic young woman who was serious enough to be interesting, but light-hearted enough to brighten his own spirits, which had been leaning heavily towards melancholy and depression lately. Ludlow's only regret was the absence of Alvarado, who had shown himself to be an exceptionally pleasant traveling companion throughout this journey. I must say, Bruchhaven is impressive, Chappelle said, as they crossed one of its many arched bridges, then you should see Zeestad, Gustav exclaimed. Lioncrest tries, but nothing surpasses the mariners and ships of Flatland. We should have sailed to Boneyard Bay with one of those. Chapelle shrugged. Actually, the Witch Hunter Order even has its own ship anchored up there. But Master von Baumeister wanted to take the shortest road, and Brughaven is closer to Seven Peaks than Zeestad is. Still, Ludlow mused aloud. Perhaps it would have been worth the detour. Flatland is part of Evanendale these days, and so we would have been supporting our own economy instead of lion crests by traveling from there. Once we find the treasure, our economy will do more than fine, Gustav said. But Chapelle ignored him, looking at Ludlow with wide eyes. Flatland is part of Evanendale? She exclaimed. When did that happen? Didn't you know? Federhel replied shocked at her ignorance, which irked Ludlow a bit. The annexation of Flatland in 1763 was a necessary political move, after the laughably incompetent rule of Governor Gus Papercook had weakened it to the point of near collapse. He even talked like he was reading aloud from a book, Ludlow observed. That is a completely one-sided view, Gustav interjected angrily. Papercook was a very misunderstood leader, the people simply weren't ready for a new approach. Federhel smiled. Calm down, friend. I have no strong opinions on these matters. I simply report back what I've read. I think I know what Alvarado would say, Rudloff said, hoping to steer the conversation away from political disagreements. The real reason to visit Brughaven instead of Seestad is Brughaven. Federhel and Chapelle both gave him the same puzzled frown. But Gustav smiled. Of course, you are right, Ludlow. Brookhaven, the best beer in the northern continent, Ludlow clarified. The best in all of Ruda, Gustav said. When they came to the sea harbor, Ludlow was overcome by an unexpected surge of excitement and anticipation as he beheld the Western Sea. Gulls cried, ship bells rang and waves roared. He tasted salt on his lips as a pleasant breeze rushed through his head. Suddenly, he felt the call of adventure and the allure of the great unknown. There she is, Federhel called out, pointing to a massive three-masted galleon that lay anchored not too far from them. Its huge red sails all bore the image of a yellow lion rampant. And above the main mast was a flag with the same image, except the red was darker and the lion was golden. 
The bowsprit was decorated with a gold lacquered figurehead, depicting a beautiful bare-breasted woman spreading her arms behind her as if she was soaring above the water. The Teresia, Federhel exclaimed in awe. Ludlow had never expected anything like this, especially after the pathetic boat that had carried them on the river. He could even see a multitude of cannons peeking out of gun ports on each side of the ship. Crewmen were climbing up and down the shrouds, shouting at each other and making final preparations for the journey. After spending some time admiring the ship, the four of them made their way to a tavern on the waterfront, and they all ordered a stein of Brughaven, even Chapelle, who admitted she preferred wine. Eventually, evening fell, and they all had to make their way to their sleeping quarters. Ludlow and Federhel said goodbye to Chapelle and Gustav when they arrived at a bridge where they had to go their separate ways. The two initiates crossed over to another isle, where Hut Verloren Anker was located. Chapelle and Gustav continued on deeper into the city. The establishment itself was decent enough, and Ludlow did enjoy being close to the seaside, even though he couldn't actually see it from his room. It was an immense relief to be sleeping alone again, in an actual bed, and for once he didn't fear the nightmares. The Departure Ludlow was already up and fully dressed when someone knocked on the door. He opened it and saw Alvarado, looking bright and eager to start the day. Good morning, Ludlow. It is good to see another man who is ready for adventure, he said. Ludlow smiled. I am ready, he said, though in truth he had woken up early because he had dreamed about Maria again. It had been that dream where blood rained down onto her pale face. A horrible image, but one he had had to endure regularly for more than a year now. Goddess, had it been that long? Maria had been murdered on the very first day of 1770. Now the summer of 1771 had arrived, and the nightmares hadn't diminished. Perhaps he would have them for the rest of his life. That was a horrifying thought, but he refused to let it dampen his spirits today. Alvarado led Ludlow outside, onto a porch, looking out over the waterway, where they were about to have breakfast. From where he sat, Ludlow could see gondolas passing by, carrying richly dressed people. Federhel and Tuomgard soon joined them at the table and ordered breakfast. When Ludlow asked for eggs, he was shocked to hear the waitress ask whether he would like a horse's eye. Federhel laughed and explained that it was simply a literal translation of a local term for eggs fried sunny side up. Leontish is a strange language. Tomgard said. Hearing the locals speak, it doesn't sound at all like Gustav's accent. It's almost the same language as Flatlandish, actually, Federhel said. They just pronounce it very differently. And they have all kinds of varied dialects, of course. And over here they speak a particularly strong one. Ludlow noticed an annoyed glare from Tomgard, who obviously didn't enjoy being lectured by an initiate. Ludlow, on the other hand, was impressed by the breadth of Federhel's knowledge. What do you know about the history of the treasure, Federhel? Ludlow asked, recalling his earlier conversation with Alvarado in the Western Wilds. Apparently, it involves the gypsy peoples. Federhel nodded enthusiastically. It certainly does. A great deal, in fact. How? Ludlow asked. What do gypsies have to do with Esclavia? Well, the story goes back a long time in history, long before the gypsy people existed, Federhel began to explain. Ludlow knew that both the Sintra and the Ungra gypsies were the remaining descendants of the people of Oskurta, a wealthy city-state in the far north with a rich history steeped in magic and mystery. Oskurta was about as far removed from Boneyard Bay as was possible within the northern continent, however, and he had no idea how the two could be connected. 
Do you know how Oscorta came to be? Federhel asked. Not really, Ludlow admitted, somewhat ashamed for his lack of historical knowledge. Didn't it have something to do with Urba Classica? It does, Federhel said. But it all really begins with the people who lived on the archipelago of Garadoso in ancient days. Ah, the Matpatanian civilization, Ludlow said, happy to be able to contribute something to the conversation. I've heard of that. So have I, Tomgard said. They worshipped all kinds of gods, didn't they? They did, and their empire covered all of Esclavia, Alvarado said. But then the Orba Classicans defeated them, destroyed their civilization, and used them as slaves. That's an oversimplification, but it will do, Federhel said. The story begins when a large group of slaves from Garadoso was sold to an Orba Classican mage known as Plinius Novacula. By some accounts, the most evil magic user who ever lived. This was a part of the story Ludlov had never heard. He leaned in, fascinated and eager to hear more. Novacula was also incredibly rich and powerful, which gave him the power to do whatever he wanted in his city. He had a vast underground dungeon where he lived, worked and kept his slaves. He used them in all sorts of terrible magical experiments, and eventually the slaves rebelled and killed him. Now, legend has it that before he died, Novacula had succeeded in creating a portal that could instantly transport him to a faraway location. Knowing that the Orba Classicans would execute them if they remained in the city, the slaves escaped through that portal, which took them far to the north, to Escorta. So, the Oscortans began as escaped slaves from Garadoso, Ludlow said. But Oscorta became rich and powerful. How did they do that? Novacula was rich and powerful, Federhel said, and all his possessions were in that dungeon. I see, Ludlow said. But how is all this related to the treasure of Boneyard Bay? It's not that hard, Ludlow. Tom God said. Novacula's wealth is the treasure. Again, Federhel interrupted with a smile, it's not quite that simple. Do you all know the tale of Queen Sintrasha? Everyone at the table nodded. Queen Sintrasha of Oscorta had been a powerful mage who had been involved in dark magic until an angel had visited her with a warning that only arcanic magic was sanctioned and other forms would lead to the destruction of her nation. Sintrasha had converted, but only managed to convince a minority of her people. Eventually, she had been forced to leave Oscorta along with her followers, who then became the Sintra Gypsies. According to some, the treasure of Boneyard Bay is actually the wealth of Queen Sintrasha, possibly supplemented by Novacula's jewels and coins. Federhel said. I can imagine they took at least some of it along. As you know, eventually most Sintra settled in our very own Seven Peaks, but the Queen herself is reported to have travelled much further south with her treasure. Why did she take it with her? Alvarado wondered aloud. The Sintra was still being persecuted by many different factions. I think it was wise of her to hide her treasure until the time was right. Doesn't this treasure rightly belong to the Sintra people then? Ludlow said. Alvarado rubbed his chin, perhaps pondering the same question. Treasures belong to those who find them, Tungard stated. It has been many centuries, Federhel said. Most of the Sintra live in Seven Peaks. If we find the treasure, it will benefit them as well. I think it would be far better for the Sintra if we found the treasure than if the Parslavanians did, for example. Ludlov could see the truth in that, but he didn't know if Queen Sintrasha would have approved. I would like to see the Basilica before we leave, he said, to change the subject. Would that be allowed, Tomgard? I would as well, Alvarado added. And I, Federhel said. Tomgard seemed pleased by the initiate's deference and sat back in his chair. We should always make the time to praise the goddess if we can. 
Master von Baumeister expects us at the Theresia by noon. So you'll have plenty of time to pay your respects. Will you be joining us? Alvarado asked carefully. I will not. I'll go straight to the harbour to help out the master with our final arrangements. The relief at the breakfast table was palpable. The inside of the basilica was even more impressive than its outward appearance. It was a much lighter church than the Grand Cathedral of Seven Peaks, mostly due to the white stone out of which it was constructed, but it also had windows on every side. In a large side chapel, there was a gold lacquered statue of a portly woman in an oversized cloak. Santa Agnes, Federhel whispered. Ludlov knew who she was, of course. The patron saint of adventurers, Santa Agnes, once provided for all of Bruchhaven during a time of great distress, when all the food and water in the city had been cursed. She had been a very devout woman with a large house, and her supplies had been kept safe throughout the crisis. In the end, she had given almost everything away, surviving off the scraps herself before the curse had finally ended. I've prayed for her intercession throughout the plague in Seven Peaks. It seems fitting to do so again as we set out on this journey. Ludlov whispered to Federhel as they both knelt down before the statue. Tomgard stood with his arms crossed as Ludlov, Alvarado and Federhel arrived at the Theresia. Finally, he said. We are still on time, aren't we? Alvarado said. You are the latest to arrive, Tomgard replied. And don't forget, you three are the ones being evaluated. They boarded the ship and greeted the crew. Master von Baumeister, the priestess and chapelle stood nearby on deck. A man approached them, dressed in an elaborately decorated red coat, with rows of shiny brass buttons, gold-colored tasseled epaulets and an enormous feathered hat. This had to be the captain. Ah, you must be the initiates, he said in a friendly voice with a thick Leontish accent. This is Captain Brokelhoff, von Baumeister said. He will bring us safely to Boneyard Bay. I hope so, the captain replied, but Boneyard Bay is not exactly Zestad. Could still be a heavy trip. Just then, Gustav came running up the boarding plank, his face bright red and sweaty. When he arrived on deck, he almost fell over from the weight of his backpack. He just stood there, panting for a while. Then he took off his burden and greeted everyone. Right, I'd forgotten about him, Tomgard said. Goedemiddag, kapitein, Gustav panted in Flatlandish. Aha, uh-huh, a man from Flatland. That may be a blessing to your journey then, as the Theresia was built in Zeestad. I knew it! Gustav called out. A ship like this can only be made in one place. The captain inclined his head. That is true, friend. The Theresia has delivered me home through many adventures on the high seas, and I know I would never be parted from her. I named her, you know. You named the ship yourself? Ludlov asked. She looks like she would be property of the Royal Navy of Linecrest or something. Captain Brokelhoff smiled sympathetically. She was. First, my grandfather and then my father sailed with her for many years, until my father retired from the Navy. Back then she was known as the Prospector, a name he never liked. He believed a ship should be named after a woman. For our family's long service, he was actually given the ship when he retired. I believe the Navy thought the ship had become too old to sail anyway, but they didn't know my father. He completely restored her, beyond even her initial glory. I studied under him and eventually I became her captain. Then he gave the ship to me, and I finally renamed her. Who pays for the crew? Gustav asked. I do, the captain said proudly. We sail all over the seas, sometimes for trade, sometimes for war, sometimes for expeditions. My clients are nations, trade unions, even the witch hunter order. They pay me, and I pay my crew. Ludlov had never heard of such arrangements before. It reminded him again of how little he knew of the world outside of Seven Peaks. Why did you name her the Theresia? he asked. 
A wistful look appeared on the captain's face. Teresia was my wife. She died, still carrying our firstborn in her belly. And now, she lives on in here. I can even feel the kicks of my little one sometimes as I touch these timber railings. I feel her heartbeat when my hand is on the mast. I hear her breath when I listen to the waves. She was my first and true love. And now she always will be with me, in spirit only, until the treacherous seas take me back to her bosom at last. So, you're all aboard now. We are complete, von Baumeister responded. Then let us not waste another moment and set sail, said the captain. He turned and made his way to the quarter deck. Then he bellowed, Paul Anchor! We're heading south! As the ship left the port of Brughaven, Ludlow stood at the railing, taking in the sights and sounds around him. suddenly felt overwhelmed by a sense of destiny. This voyage would be no mere search for an old chest of gold. It was a journey that would change his life. Thank you for listening to the second episode of The Treasure of Boneyard Bay, A Witch Hunter Tale. It was made possible with the support of our loyal patrons, like Arno Teva, Caitlin Bredenkamp, Kat Mosseri, Osarium, Ryan Stock, Joshua Ward, Mix and Match, Joseph Stowell, Peter Strandkrone, Amy and Dallas Austin, and Matt Patain. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you want to get notified of the next episodes and future projects. Therefore, it's important that you also click the notification bell. And of course, we always appreciate your comments under the video. The next chapter is called The Sea and will be premiered next week. If you can't wait that long, you can purchase the entire story on Bandcamp or join us on Patreon to get hold of the extended edition of this story, which makes this 15-hour epic longer by 20 minutes, containing some additional scenes that explore some of the characters' backgrounds and the lore of the setting, provide more action and drama, and even contains a surprise epilogue that will grab fans of Witch Hunter in particular. Check out our Patreon page and consider supporting us from as little as $1 a month that would be a mere $12 a year, it would mean the world to us, or at least a tall chai tea latte for each of us, which is pretty awesome too. Thank you for listening to The Treasure of Boneyard Bay, and we hope you'll return next week for episode 3.